Um, I'm Dean Hoger, and I'm the executive director and president of Clean Water Action Council. And with me today is Grayson Holcomb, who began with us as an intern um, like a summer ago, and then has been our administrative assistant since uh, late last fall. And with us also is uh, Rachel Weber, who is our fall intern and who has accepted the position of um, administrative assistant starting in the spring, starting in January. Because Grayson's leaving us, she's going to graduate. So we really uh, appreciate the efforts our students do um, to make the work that we do successful. So we're going to begin with uh, Grayson. Okay, um, so our presentation is on PFAS and drinking water. So first we'll just start with the PFAS cycle. Uh, these are how PFAS can get into our water, our air, and how it's all interconnected. Um, then we're gonna move on to the EPA advisory. So there's different types of reporting units. It, specifically to our presentation, we will be using nanograms per liter and GL which is equivalent to parts per trillion, which we've heard already today. Um, for proposed compounds, it's similar to what Dr. Neary spoke about earlier. Uh, we have four parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS, and those are what we're targeting in this presentation. Uh, please note that the Wisconsin is 70 parts per trillion, by the Natural Resources Board. Uh, the Health Department recommended 20 parts per trillion and the DNR recommended 40, and we settled on 70. Uh, these are just a few of the samples that test for PFAS, and these are in municipal waterways. Municipal drinking water, sorry. Um, PFAS contaminates in municipal water. These are in the Northeast Wisconsin area, and they are all above the EPA advisory. So as you can see, we have Surgeon Bay, which is 4.8, Velders, 23, Wapaka, 5.6, Kiwani, 8.7. And we did note that in Surgeon Bay, according to Jeff Hoffman, they are reporting to lo be looking into potential sources for PFOS contamination. Um, so testing for PFAS in private wells, uh, it's generally homeowner's responsibility. Uh, we will talk about that more at the end of the presentation. You'll learn about filter options. Um, so biosolids, uh, we briefly talked about, um, they can be a major source of PFAS contamination in well water. Uh, this is more for those private well owners. Um, Biosolids are the byproduct of wastewater and they're treated at municipal or industrial sewage treatment plants. Um, they're often spread onto land because they're high in nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and farmers really love that. Um, there's just a list of what are in biosolids that municipalities are required to test for, PFAS being just added recently. Biosolids and PFAS testing at wastewater treatment plants. So these are multiple plants from Northeast Wisconsin. And it's two plants on here that are t were testing for PFAS in 2022 prior to DNR influence. Um, recent studies from University of Wisconsin-Madison, they found that PFAS can remain in biosolids, which is why it's so dangerous because they're not broken down during the sewage treatment. And they can later mobilize into the environment through the land spreading of biosolids on farm fields. Biosolids and PFAS regulation. Um, this is land application regulations with PFAS contaminated biosolids that has been proposed, hasn't been passed. Um, and these are for municipal and wastewater treatment plants. So below 16 parts per billion, there's no action required. You can just apply it to the land. 16 to 15 parts per billion, uh, a source investigation and reduction is required. So the results have to be provided to the land owner prior to when they spread onto the land. 
50 to 150 parts per billion is immediate notification of DNR staff, and they have to do a development and source reduction program to then later apply those biosolids to the land. And above 150 parts per billion, the biosolids are considered industrial impacted and cannot be land applied. Uh, so the, like I mentioned, the interim strategy for land application containing PFAS, which was the last slide, uh, was proposed in September, 20, September of 2021. Uh, and the overall goal is to continue to reduce PFAS concentrations in biosolids by using PFAS source identification and reduction strategies. But it is important to note that the DNR has not provided guidelines to the utilities for the, the testing of this wastewater yet. So the town of Stella um, is an example of where biospreading had occurred. They may they have received their um, the biospreading from a paper mill in Rhinelander, and they have recorded some of the highest levels in their wells in the nation at um, thirty five thousand parts per trillion. There is some litigation happening involving six residents, and their wells of those specific residents are anywhere from. 1,800 to 3,000 parts per trillion. So this is an example that, that the main point we want to stress is regulations are needed in biospreading. We keep uh, hearing from one of our members about um, PFAS in drill, well drilling fluids, and uh, we haven't really found the evidence yet that we know for sure that well drilling fluids used for water wells and for uh, mining test drill, core drills, do, are, are using PFAS. But it's a question that we need to consider. And I know that um, uh, this gentleman sent me a law uh, that was just passed in Colorado that uh, ex excluded the use of PFAS chemicals in a lot of different products, including drilling fluids, but primarily those drilling fluids were used there for the exploration of gas and oil. So just a question to keep in mind and maybe ask our legislators this afternoon. Okay, we're looking at uh, testing your drinking water for PFAS. And we did a lot of uh, researching um, different kinds of um, tests that one could do at home because if you're on your own well, you know, the responsibility is up to you to test your water and it may be that you don't need to test if you're in an area that hasn't suggested there's a problem but if you're wondering do I have a problem you might consider doing um, a, a test using the company Cyclopure because it's a far more far less expensive test than what you could find elsewhere it's not a certified test it's not an EPA certified test so if you were going to use this for instance in some kind of litigation or presenting evidence to uh, the DNR or, the, or a court or something, you would then want to follow up. If you found in this test, because it's only it's $79, in this test, um, you might want to then follow up with a certified test. And the certified tests usually cost somewhere between $300 and $600. Now, the nice thing about Cyclopeer is, and, and people have been saying to us, well, what happens to the filter, uh, whoops, I'm on the next part, sorry. So they'll give you a, a quick response on whether or not you need to do any follow-up testing. Now we can go to the next one. So we heard really extensively from Jack Damaris about how um, PFAS will bioaccumulate, and also it, it does dissolve in water, but the chemical properties of it make traditional technologies for removing it not as viable. So the EPA has been studying methods for removal, mostly associated with PFOAs and PFAS. Um, again, those two that are the most prevalently studied. And there's a couple filtration options. So there's granular activated carbon. This one is gonna be the least expensive and it is suitable for installing on household units, like on the faucet. Then there's ion exchange resins. 
and that is more effective than the previously mentioned one, but uh, at an increased cost. Then we have reverse osmosis. Um, the drawbacks to this would that it is that it takes a lot of water to do, and it does release discharges into the sewer or septic systems. So there's also an aggregate approach where you would be able to use mul multiple methods at once, and this would be known as a treatment rain. So uh, Dr. Beth Neary had mentioned the environmental working group in some of her slides, and here are some <laughs> examples of home filters that they've researched. And so we have Travel Berkey, Zero Water, um, Epic Pure Water, and Clearly Filtered are some names. And we have a, a few cost comparisons um, there. But one we would like to highlight is the Pure Fast water filter. So this can actually go in a standard Brita filter. So many people might actually have one of these filters at home that they could use. It is calibrated to limit the quantification of two parts per trillion of Gen X and one part per trillion for other PFAS. Um, and I believe Dr. Beth Neary said Gen X was the, that short chain, so um, it, which might be harder to filter. And this one has mentioned that it is suitable for that. Um, some of our board members brought up concerns about, well, what do you do with the filter? It's now contaminated. I can't just throw this in the trash. And one effective option that this company offers is to send back the filter to them so that they can do proper disposal. Postage paid. Postage paid. 